Welcome everyone to Paranormal Roundtable. I'm your host, Josh Turner. My friends call me Wolf, so you obviously can call me Mr. Turner. I'm I'm choking. I'm kidding. Call me Mr. Wolf. Uh, but anyways, we have a guest tonight. Before we get into that, though, uh, we have some things that we had to talk about. First and foremost, if you are listening to this on the podcast, uh, Spotify or whatever, Apple, Google, whatever, don't forget, we have a live stream that we do every Friday, and now we're doing one, a, a shorter one on Sunday nights and Sunday evenings. So we have two live streams going a week, and then we have the podcast. We, 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 we looked at the algorithms on YouTube, and Anthony, being the wizard that he is, he decided to put us on on Sunday. Well, it was really my decision, but Anthony said that would be the best time to do the second one. Right, Anthony? It was your decision, but um, I had to already thought that if we were going to do something extra sunday would be the day would be the day to do it because according to our youtube analytic that's when uh, most of you listeners are actually browsing youtube's on uh, a sunday afternoon to evening so mm -hmm. it worked out perfectly that's a big tv night too for sunday so quit watching tv and start watching us because yeah, TV's bad for your brain. Yeah, we're going to do more for your brain. We're going to grow it. Unless it's TV that our guest has produced, and we'll get into that here. In yeah, a unless it's somebody that we care about. That's yeah. a, th then it's important. But <laughs> and I'll tell you, we'll get into why. But here, here I'm going to tell you something. We have a conference coming up very quickly, September. Well, you'll see it in there on the show. Um, but we have a conference coming up September first, second, and third. The first is a VIP. Second and third are for just guests that are going to speak. A ton of people are going to be talking including the person that, that's, that we're going to be talking to tonight. And if you want to buy tickets, the link to the Eventbrite page where you can buy those tickets is, of course, always going to be in the description box below the video on YouTube. Uh, if you're listening on Spotify, just go to just go to eventbrite.com, type in Paranormal Roundtable, uh, Dogman Cryptid Conference. It should come right up. And we actually encourage you to listen to Spotify now because – we got everything worked out with them. So, yeah, we, we we like it when you listen to us on Spotify. But check out the YouTube live streams. Check out the show on YouTube, too. It doesn't matter. Either YouTube or Spotify, either way. Those are both good good platforms. Those are my preferred. But, you know, listen how you want to listen. I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm just going to strongly encourage. And, then, and also, I'm going to strongly encourage that you join our Facebook group. Now, we have almost 9,000 people on that Facebook group. Most of the people are pretty active in there, and there's not a lot of duds. So, most of the people are actually doing, they're posting stuff. I mean, literally 30, 40, you know, posts a day I'm, I'm having to approve or go through. Pretty good stuff. We get a lot of good stories out of there. And uh, people post stuff from their other groups and other shows, which I'm not biased. I let people promote and do what they want. I don't tell people, you can't promote your show here because you only listen to my show. Well, life's pretty boring without variety, right? So... People can post their stuff, and I'll, I'll approve it, whatever, including my guest tonight. He does, and, and I just approve it. Check it out. Go check out their shows. Check out whatever you think is cool, and we'll give you more. And then you can ask the questions. You know, If you can't get a hold of those people, ask me on my live stream. And so here's the important thing. The Facebook group, if you take – that when we drop the official link for this show, which we do with every show, including the lives, they will be put on to that – Facebook platform on that on that page. Okay. It's on the Facebook group, Paranormal Roundtable group on Facebook. We will drop the link. And then if you leave a comment on there, you may be chosen to win a prize. And the prize is an autographed book. We don't know which one, but it'll be an author from like Barton Nunley, Ken Gerhardt, Lyle Blackburn, David Weatherly, Nick Redfern. The list goes on and on. So if you want, if you want a chance to win a book by one of our author friends, then by all means, go and leave a comment. We usually get quite a few comments, but yours may be chosen because a lot of people have already won, so we try to pick people who haven't won. But if somebody, if, if we drop a link and it's all people who've already won, then we just pick someone to win again. So you could win again. So go and leave those comments, folks. Okay, now, without further ado, we're going to bring our guest on and we're going to talk some, uh, some Montauk, some Reptilians. And uh, a lot of other crazy stuff. So let me introduce you to my guest. My guest is Christopher Garitano. Christian, want to say hi? Hello, and thank you for having me. Absolutely. I've been on your show twice, so I only thought that it fair that you know you come on and talk on our show. And I'm uh, excited. Yeah, you you've been on the live stream though. You've been on the live stream, but some people haven't seen that. We get a wider audience from the podcast, so um, everybody. Chris Garitano here, he is actually the host of his own podcast. Tell us about your podcast, 
Chris? Well, I, you know, I started the podcast. I was always interested in uh, radio one way or another. And um, funny enough, so, you know, I, I heard like some old vintage things like the Zero Hour with Rod Serling and, of course, the Orson Welles Mercury Theater stuff. And um, then I saw a movie. It came out in the like mid to late 80s, Oliver Stone's Talk Radio. And I loved the the voice in the night character, especially in his case, the Barry Champlain character being so manic and crazy and speaking out to the world. There was always a part of me that wanted to do that. And I hosted some television, my own television shows that I produced and, and directed. And uh, I just wanted to try something different. And, you know, in the age of the the podcast, which is radio mostly, right? I wanted to keep it audible only, and I wanted it to be a variety. So yeah, a lot of the episodes do regard, uh, you know, the preternatural and the supernatural and uh, the unknown. But then I have episodes that uh, are tributes to you know, some of the most fantastic, legendary fantasy artists, Frank Frazetta or um, Steve Bissett, who was a comic book artist. He drew Swamp Thing for DC or really interesting filmmakers, musicians, just good stories, you know, and, and I like hearing those stories. And sometimes they pertain to the to the supernatural. Sometimes they don't. And it's just, I guess, the, my eclectic taste uh, coming to life in the form of a uh, a radio show and I try to frame it out in an interesting way and I put in vintage commercials and it's called off to the witch and uh, it's on all the, uh, the podcast platforms. I'm enjoying it. I'll, I'll do it as long as I uh, continue to enjoy it. Yeah. And it's a, pr it's a pretty interesting podcast. I've listened to a few episodes and I typically don't have a lot of time. Uh, so I have to pick my spots when I'm going to listen to something. And so your show doesn't waste my time. <laughs> it's one of those that I actually like. Um, and like I said, I've been on there twice. I think the most recent one's called Haunted Antiques. And then I don't know what the f the first one was it was called that I was on there. I don't know what that one's named. Um, oh, um, I think it was here. Let me take a look. It was, uh, I think it was From Beyond, I believe. Yeah. And we, when we talk about my dog man encounter, which if anybody wants to hear that, I'm pretty sure it's on there. It is. And, you know, these are all fantastic stories. I, and it goes and, – and sometimes I'll have controversial people on. Uh, and, and to some people, even the stories of the paranormal are controversial because they believe in nothing. And that's okay. I don't put anybody on the hot seat. I had um, – some months ago, I had a gentleman named Stanton LeVay. And he was the grandson of the man who wrote the Satanic Bible, and of course, that's going to that's going to be very controversial for people. But I'm not promoting anything, and unfortunately, Stanton died a month later, uh, so he had an opportunity to talk about his life story. So, to me, I could read about a tyrant in history. I could read about Vlad Tepes. I could read about anybody throughout history who may have, uh, you know, may have forged the most notorious personality. But I want to hear their story. And so I, I allowed that story to be told. And, um, you know, and then on the other hand, I, I spoke to uh, a minister who, who performs uh, exorcisms in her words. And she's in, in uh, Atlanta, Georgia. And, um, you know, that's a completely opposite spectrum of Stanton LaVey, or at least perceived. Yeah, so, the perception is, is the key because – a lot of I've list, I listened to part of that, and he was talking about how Levey would like draw people in. You know, he was really a cult of personality, and he got like like James James Man, Jane Mansfield, you know, to follow him, and all these other people that were. When you get down to it, you know, they were famous people, and they had their own. But he had a sphere of influence over over many people. You he know. did, and I think he was mostly a showman. I think he was uh, thumbing his nose at organized religion. And I think in secret, he did believe in God. I think a lot of the times we don't really know what's going on behind the doors or behind the veil of what people show us. And uh, the, I'm interested in those things too, you know, to go deeper to hear the personality of somebody. I've had people cry on my show quite a few times. Uh, you know, there was a gentleman that was James Dean's biographer, and I was interested in exploring the curse of his uh his Porsche that he died in James mm -hmm. Dean died in a horrible accident when he was a young man and and most of his success was posthumous you know it, it, two of his films weren't even released so he had not become the star that he 
he was until after his death. And so, but it, it, there's some truth to support that pieces of that car were cannibalized after the accident and there were more accidents and there were more things that happened. And the gentleman who I interviewed, um, Lee Raskin, wrote some fantastic, uh, you know, fantastic books about James Dean and cars in general. It wasn't really about the curse, but his connection with Dean was that his mother and grandmother died in a horrible plane accident shortly before Dean died in his car. So he felt this strong connection with him since he was a, a kid. And he went forward and explored this guy's life. And and some of the connections, you know, are, are mind boggling. I mean, you just cannot explain away uh, some of the things that happen after with pieces of that car. Another interesting two part episode, you know? Yeah, the whole thing with the car was called Little Bastard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was it was it was a horrible. It, a lot of weird stuff happened with that car. It I lived mean, up to its name, then. It definitely did. Yeah, yeah. It, so, so after Dean's fatal accident, uh, pieces of the car were cannibalized. A doctor had purchased what was left, and he used it in his vehicle, which wasn't a Porsche Spider, but he took pieces and gave it to a friend, another doctor, and they were in the same race together. Now that hit the friend of his, uh, I believe his name was Eskrin, he cannibalized pieces of the vehicle, the original vehicle, into his spider. It was a Porsche spider. And he got in a, he died in that accident. And the gentleman who had owned the car also he survived the accident with horrible injuries. So this went on and on. And there were, uh, you know, warehouses that burnt down. There were people that were injured in transport. Allegedly, a young girl was um, went to a display. You know, the car was being trailed around as James Dean's death car for a while. And then eventually, the car completely disappeared. It was being transported from Miami, Florida to uh, Washington, D.C. And somewhere along the way... Uh, you know, they brought it through the journey and it was brought to its final location and there was nothing inside the transport. And to this day, no one knows exactly what happened to the rest of the car. Yeah, that's crazy. It just kind of like disappeared. Somebody, somebody took it kind of like Jimmy Hoffa. <laughs> Maybe it's buried <laughs> wow. under giant stadium where <laughs> in the yeah. Meadowlands, you know, I, that, that story always intrigued me and I've always been fascinated with that whole cur the curse because there are objects that are that carry an energy and that are haunted and are cursed, and that's one of the things we talked about when I was on your show. I have a, couple a question weeks about ago. that car, actually. <clears throat> so, was uh, were there ever any theories as to who or why, how that car became uh, like a cursed object, or is it just completely unexplained? So, here's an interesting story. Here's one of the and and again, here's one of the true things. Okay, um, the car was brand new. Dean couldn't wait to get it. And when he finally did, he brought it to a restaurant to show it off to his actor friends. And th th there was the gentleman who played Obi-Wan Kenobi, okay, um, Sir Alec Guinness, was at the restaurant. So Dean said, hey, man, you know, come on out and check out my, my new car. He said, sure. He walks outside, looks at it, and... Guinness had been on some talk shows down the road, you know, much later. And he said that I, something came over me, you know, how many times do people show off their new cars every, you know, every time they get a new car, it's like, when do you ever have a friend of yours that looks at you and says, and this is exactly what Guinness said to James Dean is that you will not, if you get back in that car, you'll be dead within two days. And that was a hundred percent correct. And Dean just shrugged it off like, okay, man, thanks for letting me know. What a buzzkill. Yeah. But Sir Alec Guinness said he had a, I had a premonition that something took over my body and made me say this to him. Do not get back in that car. Now, have you ever said that to somebody, unless they were reckless, unless they were drunk, you know, uh, have you ever looked at somebody with their new car and told them they're going to die in two days and have this irresistible compulsion, the psychic compulsion is what Guinness said he had. So I think that's, that's how the story really begins in my opinion. Actually, I tell people that like on a regular basis, just so on the often chance that I could be like, you know, Alec Guinness and I could say, Hey, um, yeah, 
I said that. Because when I do that, I do, I do it all the time. My friends are like, dude, stop saying that. Okay. Well, you, let's just say it was a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Like the, he tells Dean, he gets it in Dean's head and, you know, somehow, <laughs> somehow this happened. But what about all the stuff that happened after? Oh, this, I know. This on record. Know. You know? And I'm joking, by the way, folks. I don't do no, that no, at all. I know, I know. <laughs> well, I know you know, but the audience is probably going like, what the heck? Because <laughs> I say some stuff. Go ahead, Anthony. What were you saying? I was just going to make a joke and, and say that if you if you tell that to everyone, eventually, statistically, you're going to be right at some point. <laughs> some point. And then you can go, look, so I you, told him. I was there. So you can just kind of carpet tell people that yeah. all over the place and, all the And time. every <laughs> famous person I meet, and I know quite a few, I just tell them, you're going to die in a plane crash one day. Yeah. So maybe Obi-Wan Kenobi was telling everybody that. <laughs> he had the force, dude. Exactly. I mean, it's not a coincidence that he became Obi-Wan Kenobi in the 19, was yeah. it 77 film, I guess? What was it Star Wars? 77, uh, 78? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, think, I think the first one was 77. Okay, so James Dean died in what, 55? Oh, was it 1955? What year did he die? Yeah, and here's the other thing. So, um, yeah, because it was a 50... 550 spider. So it was 55. Um, the other thing is that Sir Alec Guinness was at the restaurant with a woman named Thelma Moss, who at the time was an actor. And she later on became the head of the parapsychology unit at UCLA. She was really like, you know, when there really was one, a collegiate true study into you know, the sci factor to ESP into the into the unknown. They had those courses. And, you know, for a short period of time, she was headlining that. And I wonder if she was also feeling something at the time or the experience with Sir Alec Guinness, who she was probably dating at the time, um, made her look further into it. You know, who knows? Well, when she was at that at the Paris here's here's a weird sidelight to that too. Um, there was a case and, and there was a movie made about it called The Entity. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sure you know where I'm going with this, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. The, the parapsychology team at UCLA is the ones that actually, it was one of her colleagues that actually tried to get them to prove that this happened. Well, she's the female archetype portrayed in the movie, mm -hmm. right? And also recycled into Poltergeist and later on Insidious. That's Thelma Moss just mm -hmm. being recycled into different characters, you know? And, and that's something me and you have talked about, or is it you and I, as, as Obi-Wan would say, you and I, <laughs> we actually, these aren't the droids you're looking for. You and I actually, we've talked about this, like, and you've posed the question to me when we've been talking and kicking ideas around and you were like, hey, what came first, the chicken or the egg? Not in your, That's not what you said, but you, you posed the question of like, is it our collective consciousness coming up with ideas? You know what I mean? And then putting them out there into the universe and creating sort of, which would be my words, like tulpa type, you know, renditions of whatever, you know. And like like you were saying earlier when, when you were talking off air with me, like we speak things into reality with, with, you know, like you, everything you look at inside of like the studio right now, for example, my camera, my microphone, my, my, my monitor, the, 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 the chair, it's all someone's idea. It's all someone's thoughts and it all became a reality, but is that reality or do we need to go outside to, to, to touch a tree, to touch reality? And you were posing the, the question to me uh, this past weekend, we were talking and you said, you know, like the whole thing about reptilians and werewolves and all this other stuff, is Hollywood tapping into something, you know, to be ahead of the curve or are they making it happen? Is it the movies we watched? You know, you and I are the same age. So... Did we watch these movies and then our collective consciousness somehow summon these things up and to, to, to bring them to us? That's one question. Or is it literally like a, a, a huge collective consciousness that causes that? Or is it something that was predestined to happen anyway and like we just managed to catch it, catch it, you know, and, and at the right moment to experience it? Or, you know what I mean? Like the reptil, let's start with the reptilian thing. Like we talked about. It. Sure. I mean, okay. So my first experience with the reptilian idea was, of course, through fiction and science fiction. And in the 80s, we had a show called V. But before that, we had The Outer Limits, The Twilight Zone, Star Trek. All of these things had portrayals. Oh, Land of the Lost. Mm -hmm. The Sleestacks. Okay. 
Yeah, the not, not the comedy one that you know the kids might know about now, but it's like the, the the show. Even though that was pure comedy at times too, but you know unintentionally. But I loved that show as a kid. It's so the Slee Stacks and Land of the Lost, um, Gargoyles. Do you remember that TV movie Gargoyles mm-hmm. from the late seventies? Okay, all the whole reptilian idea is across that, and obviously going way back in history or its origins. Uh, and those people who put those in, the, in in fiction, these ideas in fiction, were well read. But when we get to V, the idea that these are now aliens with high technology, advanced technology, and are visiting Earth and hiding in human skin, that was the 80s. Moving a little bit forward in the 80s to John Carpenter's They Live, not specifically reptilians in the movie, but the same idea, you know? And, this, and the idea that they're controlling us, that they're blinding us to our own history. And so was it done on purpose? Was it put in our minds to place into fiction where the prophets became science fiction writers and, fi- and writers of fiction? So previously, prophets were writing things down and having visions and ideas. And now they now in our modern age of the last couple of hundred years or less, they are writers of fiction instead. And those prophecies are going into science fiction and fiction and movies, okay? You know, because it's not just literature anymore or paintings. Now they're in movies and it's being portrayed to us. And so now the new generations are only knowing these things in, in our modern folklore, which is fiction, which is movies and science fiction and modern literature. And so we can only associate it with something that's not real. We're saying it's, I mean, it's categorized that way in bookstores. It's, it's portrayed that way to us. And it's almost a taboo to suggest for a very long time, for most of my life and yours, it's a taboo to suggest that any of these things are other than fiction. And now it seems like everyone, or at least a majority, a much larger majority are saying this isn't fiction. This is real. And I can tell you, I've experienced this and I know, and it's gotten to the level of now where it's getting scary. Now people are talking about this and shooting up locations and saying, hey, the reptiles are are here. And, you know, some of these incidents where we had a public shooter, these guys were speaking about those things. Now, if, if you look at the Roddy Piper character and they live, his name is John Nada. Remember that scene where he goes into the bank and he starts shooting everyone? Okay, he can only see the so-called, you know, the, the, the reptilians in that movie with the sunglasses. But if you were just a human spectator in the bank, you would have seen Roddy Piper as an active shooter. That's, that's how that movie really is. And that's even more terrifying at the same time because it's like, should you question why some of these people are doing this? And of course, do not miss... Uh, misconstrue what I'm saying. I am not condoning someone doing that. It's just some of these guys are either lost their minds or are they, are they privy to something? And, you know, these, if you're, if you dare enough to ask some questions and challenge reality a little bit, we might find some answers. Otherwise, should we reduce, reduce this all back to fiction? And some people suggest that you're going to sleep if you do that. I don't know. I, we're living in a really weird time, and that essentially is what my show is about. It's that borderline between fiction and reality. And frankly, I'm I'm a neutral soul. I'm I'm an observer. I'm an astronaut. I'm just here watching and listening. I don't have the answers, but I'm I'm interested in in finding out. Yeah, it really feels like kind of a long running psyop to me to consistently portray things that are very much a part of our world as as fiction time and time again. Because if you think about it, a modern day example would be the creepypasta stories, particularly the one about the rake. If you tell someone, oh, I I saw a creature, and you describe it as as what the rake looks like, then they're automatically going to think, oh, I know where you got that from. That's a creepypasta. You read some story online, and and, and now I'm supposed to believe that that's what you saw. That's not real. That's, That's something that someone made up on the internet. But this is not life imitating art. It's, it's the other way around. It's art imitating life because that creature, that creepypasta story was actually based on accounts of people, of something that people really saw. 
you know, not not the other way around. And I think it's the same in uh, sci-fi. Like, if you can saturate the information market with fictionalized accounts of little green men, then every time someone brings up little green men, aliens, they're going to automatically associate that with the fiction that they've consumed for the for decade after decade after decade. It seems like the, the uh, blurring between real life and fiction is, is almost deliberate to me at times, and it's, it's done to obscure the truth. And, I, and I've certainly considered that, especially in recent years, where I feel uh, it forced us to re-examine reality in the last three years, m- more so than ever, you know, especially with all of the things. I mean, we have governments talking about you know, one day they're saying, we don't know what these things are. I can't confirm what these things are in the sky, these crafts, these things that are flying by. And by the way, you know, they're not of earthly origin. They're certainly not of our technology, and they're certainly not in any kind of rival government or anything like that. They've admitted to that publicly now. So you can deduce exactly what they're suggesting. And if that's the case, then that need, you need to re-examine your idea of reality, okay? Because... I didn't need a government official to get me convinced that there is life outside of this planet. Okay. And I didn't need, I don't need a government official to confirm for me that my soul goes on um, or that there are technologies and things that are hidden from us. I don't need that, but some people do. So now you have that confirmation, even though it's not slammed in your face, you have it and you need to reconsider what's going on here. One thing I do want to suggest is don't stop living your life. You have to be happy. You have to find a way. You have to enjoy your life. You have to work hard. You have to be with the people you love because, you know, the the truth could be much darker than we know. And um, you definitely don't want to lose time. But there, I think we're much more than we've been allowed to know. So like you said, yeah, there's a psyop. Well, what's the reason for it? Is a simple reason of control. Um is it, a, is it so that just to keep very few in charge and the majority asleep to be occupied? Or is there a, a larger reason for that? You know, um, is our reality complete? You remember the movie Dark City, the Alex Proyas film? Oh, man. I, I have that movie bookmarked to watch. I've had it bookmarked to watch for the yeah, longest time, but I haven't seen it, haven't haven't seen seen it either. either. Yeah. Well, essentially, and I don't want to give away too much, but it's a it's about what I'm talking about. It's about people who are being fooled into thinking their reality is one way, and it predates the Matrix, I believe. Uh, and it's being controlled by these aliens, and these people think they're on planet Earth. They think they're somewhere, and and they're certainly not. And so, you know, we've had moments in cinema that have suggested that. Even the Truman Show is suggesting to you, like. Your reality might not be what it is. And you can say, you know, you you can suggest things and make people think a certain way, but have you, and I'm sure you have, have you walked through life sometimes or met a person and be like, there's just no way this person is real. (laughs) How could a human being behave this way? Um, And if you look at nature, like if you go out in nature, there's no perfections. Like nothing is cut, you know, angular, extremely, you know. And that's how you can tell humans have been in the area, you know, because sure. th- th- there's there's straight cuts and squares and, and geometric shapes that don't, you know, that, that just don't exist in nature. And then it, it's really weird because, you know, you're talking about this reality. I had, a, I had a guest, a listener. This is not a real long story, so I can tell you. He sent me a story, and I can't remember his name. I remember what he looked like. I remember he was like a reddish blonde haired guy. And he was on my Facebook. And if you're out there listening, I can't remember your name, but the life of me, he's British. Um, he's from England, I believe. And he was was in class in university, in a university. And he, like, he fell asleep in class. And he woke up and he was, he looked at himself and he was coming out of what looked like a pod. And it was such a weird, like, like he, the way he told me the story, uh, like through Messenger, um, I remember just him saying that he was darker skinned and he looked at himself and he was female. And then like several people came up to him wearing like white, like they were dressed all in white. And I think, I think they had like lab coats on and they were carrying like these weird electronic like boards or something. 
Um, but I've heard this story one, a couple times, not just with his. So I might be getting two of them mixed up together. But his was like very profound. I remember him saying that he was like, it felt more real than this reality. And they ushered him back into the pod and told him or her, hey, go back to sleep. You know, you, 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 know, you, you need to go back to sleep and everything's going to be okay. And they gave him something, uh, some sort of substance, and it made him drift off back to sleep. And then he woke back up and he was in class and he was like, whoa, what the heck was that? Well, I've done shows on alternate realities and you start to really question the nature of reality and you start to wonder, you know, was that, a, was that him waking up from this simulation? Because, you know, you get stories from people that leave their body and then they go to what they, you know, one guy described, or I say guy, actually, it wasn't a guy, sorry about that. It was actually a, a, a middle-aged woman from Utah who actually, her husband told me the story, though, that's why I thought, because he said his wife had described this outer edge of this, like, spongy form of something that when she had left her body, and it was like she couldn't penetrate or go beyond that. Now, some people, you know, would, you know that know the esoteric would say, well, that's going into the next dimension. And if she pushes hard enough, she can go through it because she was in the fourth density. But that, you know, that's a simplification really and truly though, what is it, you know? And then of course there's people that believe that Antarctica goes all the way around the earth and, you know, it's like you, but you get stories from people like Admiral Byrd who says there's an inner earth, you go down in there and there's a whole nother world. And there's a bunch of people that claim that and the ancients write in their, in a lot of their texts about the inner earth. And that everything is actually in verse, there's the inside out. And you're, you're, you know, it's just, you start to really go down the rabbit hole. And then, you know, I know that, that the Buddhists believe that it can get really convoluted. So do the Hindus, they believe, cause they believe reincarnation and the average Christian or Muslim is going to scoff and go, Oh, that's bull crap. It's very simple. You die and you go to heaven, but what is heaven or you die and go to hell? What is hell? Because we are told in, in the Bible you know, that, that hell, like that is the place where you and all the demons and devils that are bad and everything else is going to end up, you're going to end up burning there. Right. Well, what is this abyss place that seems to exist where the demons are kind of in charge and they're torturing everybody because that's not really their assignment. Um, you know, when they are assigned to go to hell, they're going to be burning like you, they're not going to be torturing you. Um, they're not there to torture you. They're there to be punished along with you. So where, what is this other place? Well, people say, hey, it's the abyss. Well, what is the abyss? You know, what is the nature of our reality? And and then there's all these different heavens. There's like seventh heaven and, and sixth heaven and all these different levels. And it just goes on and on. And then, and then, you know, the Buddhists believe that you can get caught up on the wheel of Dharma for, you know, just cycles and cycles. And you can become, and the Hindus believe, you can become animals and then you can end up being human again. You work your way back up and then you can fall back down. And it's like, but the ultimate goal is to get off of the will of Dharma because you don't want to keep reincarnating because you're, we're living in a period called the Kali Yuga. The further it goes, the more chances of something detrimental happening to you. So who, who um, designed this afterlife? That's the question. That's the question of who is God. And then it, it goes on and on, like, you know, who created us? You know, like, I mean, wh where is the intelligent? Like, what is it? Because I had this big firestorm when I said something on my Facebook about the Sabbath, you know, because uh, Jesus says things that, you know, don't always jive with the Old Testament. And then people, they want to have their cake and eat it too. So they want to believe in the Old Testament completely, but then they also want to believe in Jesus. Because they say, well, Jesus came to fulfill everything in the Old Testament, but not really because Jesus actually, th there's some contradictions there. And then the God of the Old Testament, he wanted blood sacrifice. You know, why is he, and it says, if he, you know, he's the same today as he was yesterday. If that's the case, why did he suddenly stop? Well, they said, well, Jesus was the last sacrifice and that satisfied. So you're saying that my creator, the, the, the ultimate power of the universe, the infinite creator wisdom needed blood at one point, but then he decided to go ahead and let his son die. And now he doesn't need it anymore. Or are we just dealing with two different things where our progenitors actually not the, the the one true living God, which I still believe exists, and I believe Christ came here for that reason. But it starts going down the rabbit hole of like who or what God is, because he seems like he's many different things. 
You know, he's described almost as a dragon. You know, when when David he appears to David, he was like like a dragon, uh, Yahweh. You know, and so you're going like, what is this? You know, and like you go down the rabbit hole when you read the Quran, when you read the Vedas, when you read any of these texts. You know, when you study Taoism, Taoism, every level of 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 Christianity, and there's so many different sects. Um, that, that it's hard to decipher. Everybody believes something different. You know, obviously that's, that's the problem that the average Christians go, well, I'm just, I just believe this and that's, you know, but then another Christian says, well, hold on there. You know, I believe that everything's preordained, you know, um, because not everybody's a Quaker, not everybody's a Calvinist, not everybody's a, a Lutheran or a Methodist or a Baptist. It's all different. And everyone argues and thinks that they have the answer, but the truth is we don't know. We really don't know. Everybody's running on faith. The other day, somebody messaged me and they said, I believe this because I have faith, which you don't have. And I'm like, I said, so does your Muslim neighbor. They could not disagree with you more, but they believe completely in their faith, just like you do. And they feel it in their heart and they think it's absolutely correct. And they will die for that. And so will Christians. They will literally die for their beliefs. But the, the problem is that we can't all be right. We can't all be wrong either. But not everybody, which is contradicting, everything's contradicting each other. They can't all be correct. There has sure. to be somewhere. And the lines get blurred, you know? Sure. sure. And cultures that predate Christianity and, and Christ believed in deities and higher powers as well. Um, you know, a lot of these ideas came before that. I wonder, and it's been portrayed in... In a, a science fiction film that if an apocalypse happens in this you know generation will people believe that star wars is their mythology because they do right now like star trek and star wars in that movie reign of fire you know where the dragons take over the world mm -hmm. awesome star movie. wars is 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 mythology it's modern mythology they that is their their, their gods that's crazy yeah yeah that Ma that was matthew mcconaughey and was it Christian Bale? Yeah, I think it was Christian yeah. Bale. That, that's a crazy movie, man. Because, yeah, and these dragons, they, they wake up and they start doing what they do and they eat ash. That's a pretty, it's a pretty crazy story, but it's also allegorical in a way because if you notice how, like in the Epic of Gilgamesh, I don't know if anybody's actually read it or understands it, when you died back in those days, which would have predated Christ by, by a long ways, you're, you're, the best you could hope for was to sit at a table with your friends and eat ash. And you're sitting there going like, what in the heck is this? You know? So then there's this movie about these dragons who just eat ash. Like that's, and it's such a weird, like, you know, you, you start to look at the allegory of all these different, and me and you, uh, Chris have actually discussed, you know, doing a screenplay, which we're not going to talk about it here, but it's an allegory. It's completely allegorical, you know? For sure. Yeah. And, and when you get into the whole of, of where it comes from and how it, how it comes to be, you know, it's just so wild. And you get into all these weird synchronicities that, like, like you were saying, that, that it, doesn't, it doesn't make sense. Like, how is that even possible that these weird synchronicities all line up, you know, like perfectly? That, that's, that's why you know there's an intelligent design behind it because – I just don't – I'm not an atheist. I don't believe that things just happen, just boom, and then they exist. And there are some people who will say, well, you know, I believe in God, but I don't believe in demons. And other people that say that they believe in demons, but they don't believe in God, which is the weirdest thing to me because th – and these people exist. Like, they truly exist. They believe that there's all kinds of spirits, but nobody really running the show. It's all just random, and the spirits are just as lost as we are. And And – there are people who say, well, you know, I believe in God, but there is no no actual evil. It just emanates from us, from our shadow self. You know, kind of like Zoroastrianism. You have Azura Mazda, the God, and then you have the, the shadow, you know, which is really him, but it's the bad parts of him, you know. And then you start to wonder, is that how reality is? Is, is our shadow selves, are they competing with us? You know, and is it a it's dark like dimension? It's world Superman. Exactly. Exactly. When, when you look at that, it's so weird. But then Zoroastrianism, which is the predecessor to, to all of the monotheistic religions, they actually believe that when you die, um, you go to hell, you, you fall, you walk on a tightrope basically, and then you fall on one side or the other. 
And if you fall on the side of the fire, well, then you, you burn, but it's not uh, eternal. And it yeah. still feels like it's, and I'm not doubting any of this. I, I know there are alternate realities, but it still feels like there are conductors involved in this, designers. Doesn't it sound like something we would design in a story mm-hmm. if we were applied to, let's say, create a mythology? We would we would say, okay, so what happens next? It's like people who play D and D; they're creating all of these worlds and scenarios. And I I I'm sure it's much more complex than we can comprehend. But there must be a designer or designers, and then who created them? You know, it, it, it can go on and on and on. I I hope one day we find some answers, and we probably will. All of the answers, I don't know. Maybe this is an infinite journey. But it's it's certainly interesting to discuss and go further into it. Um, you know, I, I it's much more interesting than politics. <laughs> yeah, a lot we, cooler too, and a, a lot more fun <laughs> for sure. A lot less divisive. What, what do y'all think of this? And and Chris, you're you're such a brilliant guy. And I'd like to ask you this question because in, in Zoroastrianism, it says Ahura Mazda has no equal. He only has Angra, Angra Manu. That's the, the bad guy. But it's he's a destructive spirit, but he's a mentality. He's like a mental force. That, and it's basically something. He's like the adversary, but he's also, you know, like he is like the, the opposite of, you know, Ahura Mazda. But, but it's like he, it's, it's almost like his shadow self. And what are the origins of of this uh, perspective? Uh, well, it's Zoroastrianism, and it was it's it's from the Middle East, in particular Persia or ancient Persia. Okay, and it predated Islam, predated Christianity, and in fact, the three wise men were thought to be by a lot of the, theologians to be Zoroastrian in in, the, in in origin, and they were the ones that followed the star to Christ's birth. And would these dynamics come to them in visions? Did they ever write as to how they? Felt they knew this? You know, I don't know that because it's such an ancient religion and it's so, um, there's so few people who practice it now because it kind of gave birth to the to monotheism. And people that are Christian, um, people that are Jewish, or people that are Muslim, they, but if they're part of one of those three, what they, what they call the Abrahamic religions, which is kind of funny that they call it Abraham because it's actually, it's actually, he was not Hebrew. At all, he was a Sumerian, and his wife was there was Ibrahim and Sarawati, and that is actually from Indian. That's an Indian uh, Hindu story, and it, it it fathered you know what they believe were was the monotheistic religion, but Zoroastrianism predated it by thousands of years, just like um, the Sumerian culture. They wrote most of what's in the Old Testament has just been rewritten, and, and people don't know that. They think it's just – that's why people get so offended when I talk, and it, they, they, they don't understand. I have an absolute love for Christ, and what I'm a follower of Christ. But what they don't understand is they don't get what Jesus was trying to tell us, and they don't understand the nature of reality or the nature of what you know what, who Christ was. And, and I'm not saying we have all the answers, but I'm telling you, like, I've studied this, like, in t- like strong intent. I've just went deep, 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 and I found versions of Christ in so many different countries, all, you know, from the Silk Road, which tells me that he probably was traveling for 18 years along the Silk Road. And w- what ended up happening was all these predated religions and beliefs kind of get thrown in there, and it becomes, you know, kind of the, the, the waters become muddied. Well, what's really messed up is that when you look at the Old Testament, like I said, a lot of it's been copied from, you know, the Sumerians. And when you say, well, how is that possible? Well, it's because they were conquered by the, by one culture, then another culture was the Mesopotamians, you know, and then it went on to the Babylonians and it was the Persians. And, and the, the Israelites were in captivity to Persia when they were released. They went back home. Most of the Bible was written in 600 BC, or around that time. They, 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 you know, that they put it all together, the stories anyway. They changed some names around, gave them Hebraic names, and said, "This is what happened." But every culture has a flood story that predates theirs, of of when they wrote theirs. And then they say, "Okay, well, there's going to be this Messiah," but then they miss the mark according to Christianity and Islam. 
um, that Jesus came and they he was the greatest prophet according to the Muslims, but he was the savior, Messiah slash uh, you know word made uh, flesh to the Christians. But the Jewish people said, "No, this is what this isn't our Messiah. We're still waiting on our Messiah." And, you know, there's going to be a red calf that's going to be born and it's going to signal, you know, when the Messiah is going to be born. This isn't him. And and so when you get into all this, it goes really deep, you know, like there, there's this whole thing where they still want to cling to the Old Testament and say, well, Jesus did this, this and that. But the people who are still following the Torah, still they, they don't believe in his divinity, but the Christians do. And then, of course, the Muslims, they actually believe he's going to return. And he's going to, he's the one that's going to return. Okay. And they believe that part, but they don't believe that he was the son of God in the sense that the Christians do. But it gets even more convoluted when you throw Krishna in there, Krishna Kalik from the the Hindu tradition, because they believe that he's going to come back and set things right. Um, (laughs) And his name is Krishna. And then it just goes on and on and on. But even if that happens, does that mean that the world ends? No, it does not. Are we on the verge of a, a po- apocalyptic nightmare? Possibly. Um, but it's going to be the end of an age. That's it. It's going to wrap up the end of an age, and it's going it's, he's going to reign for a thousand years. And somebody actually posed this to me. They said, well, and check this out, Chris. Tell me what you think of this. They said, well, a thousand years isn't that long. I said, yes, it is, because according to the Vedas, a thousand years, and Jesus actually supposedly studied for six years in, in India. Okay, now he would know. He would know these books. He would know all of this. Okay, the Vedas say that the th- a thousand years—that's three hundred and sixty-five thousand years, because three hundred and sixty-five Earth or, or man-made years is one year to Brahman, which is God to them. Now, somebody said they they follow poly- polytheistic. No, they don't. He's, they're actually a monotheistic religion that believes in, 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 in a bunch of different aspects of God. Like, in other words, there's good Chris, bad Chris, in between Chris, and every type of Chris that there is, right? <laughs> we all have that. We all have these, like, one day I'm good wolf. Next day I'm big bad wolf. I don't know. But that's they believe that the God Brahman has all of these different personalities, but they all have their own, uh, uh, like, individual existence, but it's all still versions of the same God. You see, so it gets really convoluted. There's only really one God, and that's Brahman, according to them. I mean, I suppose they they forged these perspectives from observation, and their observations were probably much more keen and clear than ours, because now we have something that's clashing with and pulling us from these philosophical and theological perspectives, spiritual perspectives, and it's called technology. And what end, what might end up happening out of a great temptation to, you could say, be immortal or to heal, because that's how it's going to be offered to us. It won't just be entertainment, the, the greatest entertainment ever invented, the matrix, right? It's also going to be, we're going to fix you. We're going to fix your mental illnesses, your neurological illnesses, your physical illness, physiological illnesses. And you're also going to have the ability to think like you never have before. Oh, you can't illustrate? Guess what? Forget the AI art programs. This will stimulate that part of your brain and and you'll be like Leonardo da Vinci. Um, That's what's going to be offered to us. Now, once you start to become something more of technology and you have this way, 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 way heightened intelligence might come with a heightened arrogance as well. You might further, because we we have this arrogance about us now. We see ourselves as the most intelligent being on the planet. I disagree. Um, I think humans are all at once. Some of them are absolutely the most beautiful, wonderful creatures on the planet. And the other ones are the most destructive, horrible creatures mm-hmm. on the planet. Yep. And I don't know what's going I believe we're going to change soon, or at least a, a good deal of us are going to be augmented. I mean, they already have the technology to augment our cells, not just install biomechanisms in and, and technology that will be surgically implanted, but things that will change our DNA. They have the ability to do that now. And that's the future. You know, we, we okay, so here's another example of fiction becoming real. The superhero. 
and the supervillain. Guess what? I'm counting down the decades. It might happen in our lifetime, if we should live to see it, that you're going to see a, a, a facsimile of what we've been reading in comic books. Because if you can augment the body and the brain, well, then you're augmenting the body and the brain of protectors, and then you're augmenting the body and the brains of villains. And what do you think they're going to mimic in the future? You know? Yeah. I'm just saying. I mean, that that's one thing that we talked about, too, off air, because- Folks, I've had some long conversations with Chris, obviously. I mean, and I'm not high, by the way. <laughs> no, and, and you're not. And we, neither one of us have been high at any point when we've talked. I mean, we've just been very sober, but we had this conversation. And, and you know, there are going to be a bunch of people that are going to raise their hand and be like, I would love to be invincible. You know, um, that's what I want. I want to be invincible. And I, I, I always say that there was a time when that that was the case, I believe that the people that were here before us, they were giants. I do believe that. That sounds nuts to the uninitiated, but we are initiated. Uh, not to quote Bane, but I think I just did. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's kind of weird. We're talking about superheroes and villains. I didn't mean to do that. But when you look at, you know, our, our, the people that were here before us, and, and somebody asked me this question too, and they said, well, how come um, – or why was it that, that they were giants? What makes you think that? I said, because of the oxygen. Why do you think they live so long? I said, because of the oxygen. And it's all cyclical. You know, climate change is inevitable. It's cyclical. I don't care what anybody says. We go through patterns. The poles shift. Everything changes. Different areas freeze and unfreeze. Okay? And it's very weird. Everything in the universe freezes. And that's, oh my gosh, I think I just did another one. Was that was it Mr. Freeze? I think I just oh, did it. Yeah, one. yeah, you did, huh? <laughs> everything, free, everything at some point. Just keep quote, quoting Batman comic villains. Book villains. I don't even like. I don't like Batman. He's not my guy. But he's. I don't. He's rich man's son. I'm not really into that. But whatever. The yeah, he's not enhanced in any way. Nah, he's just a dude who's got a lot of money. So it sends the wrong message to me that if you're a dude who's got a lot of money, you can do whatever. You know, which is not a good. Red Hood was cooler anyway. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it's weird, but I actually, I liked Bane and Mr. Free. I think I liked his villains, I guess, because I didn't like him. Yeah. That's why it's, I was always rooting for them. But what I didn't like about Batman is that when Robin became Red Hood and started doing what needed to be done, then Batman turned on him. Of course. Get out of here. Well, Batman's like, you're <laughs> destroying what makes me me, you know? Yeah. By killing my enemies. I need to put yeah. him in jail so they can escape, kill some more people. Then really that blood's not on my hands, but then I won't kill them. You know, he's self-righteous, but he's also rich, but I just, I don't like him. But anyway, point is everything freezes at some point. So everything is, has a, has a freezing point, right? I mean, you know, the cold makes everything uh, just brittle and messed up. And so there goes the earth, it, you know, it changes and it goes through these cycles. Well, the people that were topside ended up inside. That's another possibility. And they, it's the inner earth. And it talks about that in many holy books and including the Bible. You know, those will be judged upon within the earth. And it talks in the book of Job, the devil says he's been walking to and fro upon within the earth. Well, when you, when you see these, these giants, they go into the earth and then you, you read about these stories from Malta, you know, the twenties and thirties, these people were taking people down into these caverns to, to, to witness these giants that were down there. The giants were down into this, in this cavern. They, they couldn't get up to where the humans were, but people, there are bunches of stories of them uh, like going down there and witnessing these people, you know, back in the twenties and thirties up to the thirties, you could still go there. And it was like a, a, a trip. You could go and you could maybe see these giants. People don't even talk about that anymore because it's so beyond the pale. People are like, that's crazy. They don't believe it. They don't understand that every time one of these skeletons gets on earth, it gets snatched up. Why is that? Because the people in charge don't want people learning about these things. They don't want us to know where we came from or to question our reality because we're, it's coming full circle and we're heading back to super, super, you know, uh, human, uh, abilities because that's what we had at one time. Those that came before us had that ability. I believe that Adam was a giant. I believe that when he was made by our progenitors, you know, and I, I say progenitors because I believe that people mistake that as God, but I don't think that that's really I, it, it. To us, it would seem like a God, and he he could live for you know hundred thousand years. Yeah, he's going to be a God, but is that the God that Jesus talks about in the New Testament, especially after he returned? No, it's not. It's two different things. 
And my friend Paul Wallace, I mean, he's done a lot of research on that. And people say, well, it's the whole ancient alien thing and blah, blah, blah. But the truth is we are about to go full circle. And like you said, we're going to end up in a matrix or whatever. Oh, you can live forever. We're going to download your consciousness. And then you, it gets into where does consciousness begin and the soul end and the consciousness end and the soul begin, you know, whatever. Like, like where are we headed? And, and have we been told all this before by a collective consciousness that's gathered information all this time and sort of a web and sort of a hive that we're living in? And then we've actually been putting it all out there in film and pretending like, hey, this isn't really real, but it is real. And what ends up happening is, you know, we lie to ourselves every day and say, no, 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 this is the reality. I'm looking in the mirror and I'm putting my pants on, I'm combing my hair, brushing my teeth, putting on deodorant and walking out the door, you know, after you shower, hopefully. But, you know, you're sitting here, you're sitting, not in that order, but you're sitting there going like, you know, is this, is this, rea is this my reality? The, you know, this mundane life that we go and we get in the car well, and we that's drive. that's part of it. Yeah, that's part of it. Mm -hmm. But all of this other stuff, it, it takes a few moments of true research. It's no longer speculative. It really is. And you can research any, Dar as you know, but, I'm, you know, for the audience, if you haven't, um, you know, the DARPA files or anything that's available to us and think about these things are available to us, what's not available. I remember there was a TV program probably 20 years ago, and I think it was 60 Minutes, and they were interviewing uh, a scientist, and he um, he was studying – DNA and he was studying DNA splicing. And I remember, I think it was Diane Sawyer that was interviewing him. And she was like, well, you know, you sound a little irresponsible with some of your ideas. And he's like, I want to make tiger people. That's exactly what he said. And she's <laughs> like, well, now why would you do that? He's like, because I can, and I'm going to go to South America to do it. And this guy was brilliant. Now that was 20 years ago. You think he's gone to South America to make tiger people? I mean, there are people that confirm this is scientists that I spoke to when I was making Strange World that confirm a hundred percent that this is a real thing. And so where do you think this is going eventually? You know? Do you think that th this is where we get the whole stories of like dog man, werewolves? Like th are, is this well, you're saying it, it, it's coming full circle. Is that a possibility that we were we are now just simply mimicking what happened before? What what happened? See, okay, because we look back in folklore and we see it on archaic traditional terms. Now we're looking at things in modern terms. So, archaic traditional terms in folklore, if you look at the X Men, are uh, you know Greek mythological you know powerful people like Hercules and different characters. Now we just see it in a in a modern veil and a modern um, skin and a modern vessel. Like you're looking at it through the way we see things now. We, we can't look back and see things archaically anymore. You, you have to look at it the way it is now. And I wonder once the generations pass and people start to change, because we can change in whatever this reality is, they're going to be able to change us physically, physiologically. There's also going to be that matrix thing where you can go in there and be anything you want. Also, I'm just... You know, we, we might see a lot of this before we split, or we might even have the option to be semi-immortal. You might be able to live hundreds of years with the way things are going, um, or we might self-destruct in the next couple of decades. I don't know. All right, that's all the time we have for tonight, folks. Thank you for joining us for tonight's special Thursday night bonus episode with Christopher Garitano. Don't forget, we're coming back tomorrow, just like we do every Friday, with a very special live stream because we're going to have David Weatherly in studio with us. So that's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to hit you again Sunday with another live stream, and then we're going to be back Tuesday with a pre-recorded podcast episode, and then we're going to hit you again next Thursday with another part of our Thursday night Christopher Garitano bonus episodes. So we got a lot coming. we got a lot in the works. Thank you for being here. Thank you for supporting us. Thank you for listening. Good night. <laughs>